Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to our Integrative Dental Medicine Scholar Society live webinar. We're so thrilled that you're joining us tonight. We're going to chit chat just a little bit here at the beginning uh, while others are joining us. I'm Dr. Gina Pritchard, a nurse practitioner with a private practice in Frisco, Texas, and I'm joined by Dr. Tom Neighbors and Laura Hooper. Tom and Laura, uh, introduce yourselves and uh, say hello to everyone. Well, thank you. Uh, well, as Gina said, I'm Tom Neighbors, and I'm so proud to be a part of the IDM SS Society there. Uh, our goal, of course, is to bring all healthcare providers together so that we can do a better job of improving healthcare outcomes. The concept of collaboration cures has been introduced to us through the AIOS community. And for those that are familiar with AIOS, this is sort of an extension of that. We're not trying to replace AIOS in any way. We use AIOS once a year to bring in speakers and provide new information. Uh, and then uh, the IEM Society is really geared toward practical application of that new information. And as you listen tonight, there are a no number of areas that we will deal with called the pillars of the IEM uh, Society group and how that affects all of us in healthcare. So with that, I'll turn it over to Laura. Good evening, everyone. Laura Hooper here as an IDM Scholar Society co-clinical director with the rest of my team. And obviously coming from direct diagnostics on salivary testing, going to be always so important when we talk about our pillars and everything that we're doing, but also getting to be a part of Dr. Gina Pritchard's The Prevent Clinic, that we get to pull in all of these really collaborative efforts into one arena. And that's what's so exciting about um, being a part of the Integrative Dental Medicine Scholar Society is that you get all of these different avenues coming together and collaborating together, ideas, brainstorming, implementation. And that's really what's exciting and different that's going on right here with IDM. So as you're listening in tonight, I hope that you will see just the great opportunities that are available to everyone. Absolutely. And if anyone happens to be scrolling tonight and sees us pop up on Facebook or your social media app that you happen to be on, and you're an MD, a DO, nurse practitioner, or a PA, stop, because this is for you as well. You may think it's just for dentist and dental hygienist, but nothing could be further than the truth, because just as... Laura and Tom said, this is for everyone. We all have to come together and collaborate in order to save lives and to improve our patients' health and longevity. So I hope you'll join us as well. Um, Kim, I believe we can start the slides now. And uh, Kim Bagby is uh, on with us as well and will be uh, helping us with our technical aspect and with the presentation. It's time for a revolution in healthcare. I know you've heard us say that before, but we absolutely have to change the old paradigm and join this new shift toward health-centered dentistry. And as you'll notice tonight, Whit Wilkerson is not with us. And I know he's incredibly um, disappointed that he can't be here tonight. Those of you who follow us know that it was uh, rescheduled from last night to tonight. And so if you'll go to the next slide, please, Kim, I want to tell everyone that Whit is not here because his dear mother passed away. Uh, and he, um, of course, is with the family and they are um, making plans and all together tonight uh, as she passed away yesterday evening. And so as exemplary as her life was and very applicable to our topic tonight, I want to read to you what Wilt Wilkerson wrote in his book in 2019, uh, his book, The Shift, uh, The Dramatic Movement Toward Health-Centered Dentistry, in the acknowledgments he spoke about his mother. I didn't ever meet her personally, but anyone who ever met her had just exemplary things to say about her. And so Witt says in 2019, when she was still alive, uh, in the beginning, there was mom. My mother, Dorothy Collins Wilkerson Templet, is an inspiration to all who know her. She has always exemplified a life committed to total health. My earliest memories include her daily routines of juicing carrots and celery, hands full of vitamins, weighing on the bathroom scale, jogging, biking, golf. 
um, Bible reading and much prayer for her kids. This goes back to the 1960s. And Witt says, thank you, mom, for being such a great role model and cheerleader. I'm your biggest fan and love you so much. And I wanted to read that tonight for one, because of course, all of us on this, giving this presentation and those of you listening, Witt Wilkerson is near and dear to our heart, okay. as was his mother to all who knew her. And I love the stories that I hear about Dorothy Collins Wilkerson template. But this picture that Witt uh, had shared with us was from two years ago. So she would have been 99-ish, 98-ish. Uh, she lived to be over 100. And um, because of those choices she made, just the few that we know about that Witt wrote, wrote about in the book exemplify and are an example and an encouragement to all of us to choose the apple over the donut or to choose to go to bed early and get a good night's sleep or to choose to go for a walk or a run rather than sitting on the couch after we eat. Uh, I'm just so um, inspired by her story. And that wasn't popular back in the 1960s, right? We were a health nut if you acted like that back then. Today, it's at least culturally changing a little bit. So anyway, our thoughts and our prayers are with Witt and his family. Uh, and may Dorothy Collins Wilkerson Template rest in peace. Amen. Laura or Tom, anything else you want to say about Dorothy? No, I do appreciate what you've just said, Gina, other than the fact that we love Witt so much, and we know that Witt was so inspired by his mother. We've often heard those stories, and uh, our prayers are with Witt and with Pat and their entire family. So we love you, Witt, and we wish you were here. Yes. And I just want to ditto that. I think she's just such a strong light and a guiding force, not only you know, a matriarch in their family, but such an extension through her church and her work that she did in life. And I just think, you know, just want to honor that in her memory, all those that knew her and just to take that legacy that she has provided that that carries on. And really we're seeing that in what what's doing, right? What an amazing role model, like you said, to be able to reach the age of 99, right? Not many people get to say that and be able to follow those footsteps of just health and vitality. We talk about longevity. What does that really mean? As you can see, she was still, you know, talking and amazing brain function and just participatory in life. And I think that's so important for all of us and the work that we do. So I do say just honoring his mother, but really an honor to him to be able to carry that out to all of us. So again, we're with Wit tonight and his own family, um, but very excited to, to live on her legacy and take that into the work that we get to do each and every day. Absolutely. Beautifully said. Okay, Kim, let's get started. Let's jump into our first slide, which is really just an introduction about the foundational principles that we stand on uh, in our Integrative Dental Medicine Scholar Society. And you can click the next, um, there we go. So, you know, we have three pillars that we talk about in Integrative Dental Medicine. One, the inflammation and infection pillar. Secondly, the airway and breathing pillar. And lastly, the pillar of TMD, or TMJ problems and occlusion. Next slide, please. This is all, of course, uh, linked together. Not only is it linked in the oral focused care, but it's linked to systemic health, which is the whole purpose of us collaborating and, and bringing this presentation to you tonight. This is the book that we just read from that uh, with has written and was published in 2019. And this goes into great detail about all three categories of inflation, inflammation, infection, airway, breathing, and sleep disorders, and TMD, dental malocclusion. So I encourage everyone, if you haven't read The Shift, to please get that book. It's excellent. We can go on to the next slide, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'll take it from here. So as we look at our IDM group, um, each of us has taken a, a particular section. The section that I've been asked to discuss is on the area of 
chronic systemic inflammation that is related to infections in the mouth. So we ask the question really here, why is the subject of inflammation so important? Uh, I remember a number of years ago in Time Magazine, the cover was the silent killer and the focus was on inflammation. What we know today based on the uh, World Health Organization is that worldwide diseases of chronic systemic inflammation are responsible for greater than 60% of all deaths. And that includes stroke, cancer, obesity, diabetes, heart, and chronic respiratory diseases. So let's go to the next slide, please. So we might ask the question, um, what are we looking at when we think about chronic inflammation? What is our mind what is it picture? And we may look at these particular pictures and say, well, mine focuses on back pain or knee pain or hand pain. And we see this particular slide that represents the redness and the inflammation story. So when we discuss chronic inflammation and the mouth, we are gonna turn away from the clinical presentation of uh, infections in the mouth that we might call periodontal disease to really the cause of periodontal disease. And we'll talk a lot about oral pathogens when we have uh, these virtual seminars or when we have the live seminars. So the next click, please. So when we think of the mouth and the next click, please, when we look at the visual signs of what we would call chronic periodontal disease or periodontitis, we recognize today that periodontal disease is the most common chronic infectious inflammatory disease of all humans. When you think about that, that represents anywhere between 80 to 90% of the world population that have some form of this disease, which is amazing, amazing and astounding. Typically, we used to say, well, let's try to control the disease. But in our collaboration cure uh, study, what we're trying to do is let's say, let's cure the disease and let's see how this affects the rest of the body. Uh, click again, please. So oftentimes we compare uh, periodontitis to diabetes. I used both of these photographs to show a diabetic ulcer. And if you look at them visually, and if you look very closely at the tissues around the teeth, they look very similar to the tissues of this chronic diabetic lesion here. And when we look at studies relative to the comparison between the two, they will say that in order to treat the diabetic lesion, yes, it's important that we, see, that we treat the surface of the lesion, but that's not enough. We really have to treat the source of the problem in order to help cure this disease. Well, the same thing is true relative to periodontal disease. Next click, please. And as you will see here, Periodontal disease is really not about pockets. I know that's the term that we oftentimes use, but we really need to change the term. This diabetic lesion is a wound. It's an open wound. It's a lesion. The same thing is true in periodontal disease. We're not really concerned about pocket depth. We're really concerned about wounds. We're really concerned about the lesions. And if you look at these two, you'll see that they look very similar. And if we use the same analogy here relative to diabetes in treating this chronic infection in the mouth, the first thing we have to do, of course, is in set our minds on what's causing the disease. Of course, we have to do certain things in both of these relative to cleaning the areas and disinfecting the areas. But the most important thing that we have to do is understand finding the source, treating the source, and then we hopefully can cure both of these types of diseases. So next slide, please. Uh, the other thing we'll be talking about in our, in our IDM group is how this affects not only our patients, but how it affects each one of us. What well, we've learned in these two particular studies, the New England Centenarian Study, Longevity Genes Project, and the Long Life Family Study, is that every one of us, click please, is either on a fast or a slow path to chronic disease. So what we want to do in our IDM is to make sure that each one of us knows which path that we are on. Click please. What I recognize in my life, click please, is that um, 
13 years ago, I was actually on the fast path. Path B is the path where we have chronic diseases at a very early age. And path A is where we have chronic diseases later in life. Click on that, please. And what I have learned through collaborating with the Dr. Genas of the world is that we can actually reverse the fast path and be in a slow path. Uh, so part of our group uh, is to recognize that each one of us is important to our families and our families, of course, want to learn this as well. So let's go to the next slide. So for those of us that are in, let's say, oral health, um, when we look at relative studies to this particular topic, this is an excellent slide that was published just a few years ago, and it was entitled Quobatis, and that is, where are, what is the future of periodontics? So click on that first circle there. So our first responsibility in oral medicine is to help assess the particular path that our patient is on. That path, if you click again, is recognized by these two studies. If you click one more time, we'll recognize that the first responsibility that we have in helping to achieve uh, or prevent individuals, including ourselves, from having a chronic disease is to resolve periodontal inflammation and then to understand how to monitor systemic inflammation. So if we'll click a couple of more times, the way that we do that, and we'll learn this through the IDM group, is to monitor quantitatively the local endpoints of therapy. And the way we do that is to, again, look at causation. And we're going to do that through salivary diagnostics. Now, we'll collaborate with the Dr. Genas of the world and other um, physicians that are will teach us how to monitor systemic inflammatory burden, as well as monetary uh, systemic parameters that are important for all of us. And we'll bring all this together recognizing that the more effective that we are in treating and resolving periodontal inflammation, the more effective our physician colleagues can be in treating diabetes, heart disease, and so forth, and vice versa. Both of those work very, very nicely together. So if you go to the next slide, what we're saying is that periodontal disease is a silent pathogenic and inflammatory war that sets all areas of immunity on fire. In our IDM group, we will actually look at this more closely relative to the mechanisms that actually, where these periodontal pathogens directly affect the innate and the adaptive responses, and we'll understand why addressing the pathogens are so critical. Next slide, please. So salivary diagnostics is where we are today in recognizing how we can achieve a diagnosis that is based on causation and then helping to resolve these periodontal inflammatory stories is directly centered in resolving and eliminating these periodontal pathogens. So in our IDM group, we'll show you how to take a saliva test, how to send it to the lab and how that relates to not just periodontal disease, but how that relates to all diseases of chronic inflammation. In fact, each one of you will have an opportunity to get your own saliva test so you can see where you are as well. So I think that's the end of my inflammatory story. Just very briefly, we, we would like to for you to join us at our virtual meeting in February and at our live meeting in August where we can explain this more deeply. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is our slide report, actually a result report from a salivary test that represents the major pathogens that we test for and how that all relates to periodontal disease and how the, they, that also relates to systemic inflammation and in those diseases that we've just discussed. Next. So eliminating or controlling keystone pathogens is critical to controlling systemic inflammation. Next. So now we'll turn that over to Dr. Gina and Laura. So Laura, and mostly, of course, you're going to speak here, but I just want to pause a minute on what you said, Tom, and yeah. that is eliminating this inflammation in the mouth is critical 
to the thorough and complete treatment of systemic disease because many of our colleagues that are in primary care medicine or even longevity medicine, functional medicine, a prevention focused path, uh, practice, but really even our cardiologists and our gynecology friends have not historically had periodontal pathogens uh, in their differential diagnosis in terms of what could be contributing to a systemic inflammatory problem, such as diabetes, such as hypertension, such as cardiovascular disease, and even as we know, um, problems during pregnancy. Absolutely. So it's absolutely critical that we collaborate, but I appreciate you laying the foundation for that and the science behind not only will we age more rapidly than we choose to do, than we want to do, uh, but at which we can slow down that process, but we will have these chronic diseases in our future if we're not thinking about oral health now. So of course, Laura uh, coined this term, if you will, airway to pathogens to plaque. And so I just want to comment before she uh, speaks that um, Tom just described these oral pathogens and the imperative uh, identification of them, the imperative need to identify them and treat them thoroughly. But if someone has a sleep disorder or is desaturating, in other words, their oxygen level is lowering at night, then it's nearly impossible to have a healthy microbiome where you can continue to have these pathogens eliminated because the environment is just favorable for the pathogens to grow for, for one reason. So this, this issue of, am I breathing well? And am I breathing in a healthy way through my nose most of the time, day and night, we've called airway or an airway problem, airway disordered breathing. Uh, some people know it as sleep apnea, but really that's just one type of an airway disorder. And this problem of course occurs in children and all throughout life, any sleep disorder or airway related disorder. And that, as I just said, impacts these uh, pathogenic bacteria and the pathogenic bacteria make it more difficult to treat the airway problem for many reasons, which we don't have time to go into on this talk. But my whole point about saying that is, if you have an airway disorder and you have a pathogen, uh, high risk pathogen, and if you have one, you'll likely have the other, Absolutely. but either way, you likely have plaque in your arterial wall, meaning vascular disease. And that's why Laura so often says, airway to pathogens to plaque. So Laura, take it from there. Yeah, thank you. I just wanna kind of get us all kind of thinking about our full assessments. How do we really evaluate our patients clinically? Um, and then what we we're just talking about subclinically, things that we can see that are going on. And this is one of those areas where we cannot see this occurring always clinically. So when we're talking about airway, it's everything that Dr. Gina Pritchard just talked about. But there are two big pieces that jump out. One is, as you see here, the desaturation oxygen, right? So we're talking about just even a desaturation of oxygen has a major impact then on the increasing, we're shifting from aerobic to anaerobic. And when that happens, we're creating an environment for these oral pathogens, these type of oral bacteria to actually increase and grow and take hold. From there, there's also a second phenomenon that's happening because as we're decreasing or desaturating this oxygen level, we're also decreasing our nitric oxide levels. And this has to do with our third piece, but it also is connected to the middle of pathogens. So just follow me on as you decrease your oxygen, you're decreasing your nitric oxide. You have to have that nitric oxide, these enzymes and these types of bacteria that actually reduce that nitric oxide so we can utilize it. Well, it's actually through these pathways that if that's not happening, again, we have this increase in these oral pathogens because they're so opportunistic. And these are the types of things that you would learn at IDM. And that's why we're just kind of introducing these concepts because you're doing these assessments, you're doing sleep assessments, you're doing periocharting, you're looking for these pathogens, you're saliva testing, but the impact that it has on the body is the third piece. It increases plaques. So I always like to say plaque in the mouth is plaque on the heart, 
which is plaque on the brain. Plaques are plaques. And so as we have these pathogens increasing, everything that Dr. Newers just told you about the inflammation, the impact it has on the body. And one of the ones that we talk a lot about is the direct correlation to plaques not only in our coronary arteries, but in our also carotid arteries that we can measure and have value for and actually track in our patients. So just start to think about, do I have an airway problem when I'm looking at my patient? Is there desaturation? Do we have a pathogen problem? Because it actually is contributing to us growing these types of anaerobic bacteria. And then these bacteria cross over all epithelium and endothelium linings. So all the linings in our bodies. And what do they do? They increase the plaques. They are causing plaques throughout the body. And that's then everything that we started with inflammation, truly understanding that first pillar of inflammation and infection that we will dive deep into as you join us at IDM. So tell us, do you want to dwell a little bit? I know we're going to show some of the tests here, Dr. Pritchard, but as we decrease that nitric oxide, we know we're having an increase to then in some of these pathogens, but that nitric oxide, I always like to do this, the little wave, everyone can do a wave out there. I'd like to see some Facebook waves going on. That nitric oxide keeps our vessels, right? Nice and flexible. So what happens if we don't have, we're not getting oxygen right? We have these pathogens increasing, but in the arterial wall now, it's not very flexible. We don't have a wave going on. What actually happens as we now have this nitric oxide issue happening? Yeah, so um, most of the nitric oxide is made in the nose through proper nasal breathing. And so we know based on Nathan Bryan's work and many others that Certainly we need nitric oxide boosting foods, the dark greens, the beets, et cetera. But I, I have to be saddened as I look back and I think about how many patients I've encouraged them to eat more dark greens and more beets. And now I know I was sitting there looking at a patient that had a major sleep disordered breathing problem or an airway disorder. So they could have eaten all the spinach in the world, all the beets in the world and not overcome this nitric oxide problem that you're talking about, Laura, because you have to have efficient nasal breathing as we've discussed. Um, but with not, nitric oxide is low, several things happen, but for the purposes of our talk tonight, most importantly, it's very difficult to control blood pressure because the arteries uh, have to dilate. All of our blood vessels have to dilate in order for our blood pressure to lower, and they have to constrict when we need higher blood pressure, and that ability is lost. Nitric oxide is necessary for a healthy endothelium. You mentioned that, Laura. That's the lining of the blood vessels where plaque can get into the wall of the artery. So the first line of defense, so to speak, is to have a healthy endothelial lining in the vessel wall. And nitric oxide is necessary for that. Your arteries need to be bathed in nitric oxide. So um, nitric oxide testing, we'll talk about in just a minute, but is absolutely key. Um, whether you have an airway disorder or not, but if you have an airway disorder, it's very likely you're low in nitric oxide. Uh, next slide, please, actually, because we've talked about our colleagues, and of course, we want our colleagues thinking about these tests we're just going to show briefly. But if you're not a, in the healthcare profession and you're listening to us tonight, know that these are three tests. And then we'll, we have two slides where we'll talk about even more than three tests. But three tests, if you haven't had done, and actually, if your children um, think about your younger, for sure, your teens and your 20s, your 20 year olds and older need these tests. And maybe even children that are younger than that. And you need to really come to IDM to, to hear all of the details surrounding all of the above. But one of the tests you wanna ask for is, have you had a home sleep test? Very easy to do these days. There's a ring option, there's a watch option. This happens to be an example of the watch pad, which is a watch that you wear at night. And it does a very good job of helping us determine if you're having these desaturations, low oxygen at night and an airway disorder during sleep. Then next uh, click, please. Then the next test you want is what Dr. Neighbors and Laura have been talking about, the HR5 direct diagnostic, HR5 standing for high risk five. So you want to know about these five bacteria that are uh, the abbreviation for each is underneath the bars there, PGAA, TD, TF, and FN. 
Uh, you want to know if you have any of those bacteria in your mouth. And if so, then your medical team and your dental team need to work together in order to eradicate those pathogens and see what damage they may have already caused and systemically and treat that as well. And then lastly, you want some arterial evaluation. You can click Kim to the next one. And this is an example of what Laura was talking about earlier, where we can look at your carotid arteries with ultrasound and tell if there's early stage plaque or even late stage plaque. That's an easy test to do. Uh, as, and as an outpatient in the doctor's office, um, ultrasound, you all are familiar with ultrasound technology. It's just a probe on the neck to look at the artery wall and take some measurements. We also now are looking at the heart using CAT scan to get fine detail about what's going on in the heart arteries that could be um, from oral pathogens and an airway disorder. So next slide, please. Inflammatory cascade can be identified with these. So as Laura said, uh, tests in the medical and the dental office include from an airway standpoint, the sleep test, such as the watch pad that we saw, you can actually test for nitric oxide, as Laura spoke about, with just a simple saliva uh, strip, a uh, test strip of the saliva. ADMA is a blood test that can help us uh, get clues about uh, sleep disordered breathing problem and nitric oxide problem. We've talked about the HR5 test, which is just a simple saliva test that you spit in a tube. And lastly, we talked about the ultrasound test of the carotids and the CT scan of the heart arteries. Anything else before we go on to the next pillar, uh, Tom or Laura? No, I think that's great. I think just starting to make the connection as we move through why we start there and move through and start to connect the tests together of what the story they're telling of our patient. But great yes. explanation. Absolutely. So I think both the public that are not healthcare professionals as well as healthcare professionals can start to see why it, you absolutely have to have a great dental team and a great non-dental medical team on your healthcare team uh, looking after you and helping you with these things. And those uh, those teams are imperative. Next slide, please. We just want to say a couple of things about the second airway. I mean, the second pillar, uh, next slide or next click, which is airway. We've talked about that already, but uh, Laura and Tom, we have one slide, I think, and you can go on to that next slide, Kim, where we wanted to talk just briefly about children. Uh, we've talked about nasal breathing already, but just to remind you, nasal breathing, not only is nitric oxide uh, formed when we breathe through our nose, as we've talked about, but it's important to breathe through the nose for air filtration, sterilization, nitric oxide release, as we've discussed, humidification, it warms the air, uh, controls the rate of the breathing, and it gives you that carbon dioxide and oxygen balance that's imperative for health. Uh, red blood cell protect, production, and then VO2 max increase, helping us with our um, energy level and ability to perform. Uh, so you want clean air, you want warmed air, you want humidified air, etc. So nasal breathing, incredibly important. And then uh, secondly, I really want Tom and Laura to talk about children. You can uh, click on through all the rest of this slide, Kim, which will be several clicks, I think, because most people don't think about snoring in their child uh, as something that's scary. So Tom and Laura, talk to us about that a little bit. And I'll you just, can continue I'll to click just, two more yeah. times, uh, Kim, sorry. Okay. I'll, I'll just kind of start that. And I would suggest that this is a relatively new inspiration for those of us that are in oral medicine. <clears throat> And that is for many years, we have noticed, you know, individuals that have tongue thrust and that their occlusion is off the maxillary teeth tend to be more prominent and there's space between the maxillary teeth and the lower teeth. Um, I'm not sure at, you know, 10 or 20 years ago that we recognized this was really a real breathing problem. We tended to think this was an orthodontic problem. Today, we recognize though that this is a breathing problem and can um, be recognized very early uh, in children. Uh, so with that in mind, um, those of us who are dentists and dental hygienists, those of us who are in oral medicine are starting to recognize that children do have breathing problems. I think mothers can recognize this even sooner than we can when your children can't sleep or your children are restless and your children are snoring 
or that when they wake up in the morning, they're really in a bad mood and they're that way all the time, uh, that may be a signal to you that the children has breathed, the child has a breathing problem. The point being is that the IDM uh, a gathering, there'll be experts that will be talking about this. And, and certainly WIT is real, a real expert in this particular area. Dr. Wilkerson, uh, we're not gonna be talking about TMJ and TMD disorders, but he will be also talking about sleep issues, particularly in children as well as adults. So Laura, do you have anything you wanna to add to that? Well, I just want everyone to look at the clean versus dirty. It's like the, you know, dirty dozen over here. You're going from clean, everything that Dr. Pritchard talked about that the nasal breathing is capable of doing and just taking away that one aspect in our child and our children, look at what we're setting them up for. And that's on that dirty side, the microbes. So we're talking about these pathogens, right? And so pollutants, pesticides, smog, allergens, pollen, spores, all the things that they can't filter as you see that filter. And this truly is then as we're seeing here, the things that the tonsils are then supposed to be helping us with. And that's why we see them enlarge. So again, just clinical application every day that you're looking in the back of the throat and you're seeing that long uvula, you're seeing these children coming in with enlarged tonsils that we can help them so much. And just really taking a stance on starting early, starting prevention early, that they don't have to be set up for failure throughout their life, that you are witnessing the first stages of this inflammatory cascade. And it's starting right here. That's why I started with airway, because can we catch our children? Can we catch this before we have a major inflammatory event before we get to the plaques, before we get to all the things that we talk about on the severe medical side, let's make a difference in our children. So love that we get to start here. And I know there's some comments coming in talking about this, you know, just starting to treat our children from birth. Even somebody may comment their joy age three, um, people talking about nitric oxide testing. So thank you for participating here with us tonight. Love that. Please continue to add the comments as you're listening to us. We'd like to hear and see what you're doing. But I think this is really a focus. I want to give kudos to AOSH, um, Dr. Mark Cannon, who really, you know, speaks from the heart and is so authentic on this topic as well with our children and the difference that we can make. I love when he asks, can, you know, can we put an end to heart disease just by starting with our children? And I say it starts right here, right? Let's start right here. <laughs> but we still have all of us to treat. So we got to go on. We got So let's go to that next slide. Keep uh, clicking, Kim. You can click all the way through this slide. This is uh, talking about the third pillar of temporal mandibular disorders or uh, joint related issues. Talk to us briefly about the involvement of that. It's not the main focus of our next IDM course, of course, but it's always on the mind, I know, if you're in the dental office. I know, uh, Dr. Tom, you're yeah, muted there. Okay, thank you. Well, again, I wanna recognize Dr. Wilkerson and his uh, journey um, of all the people that I know, um, WIT is uh, certainly world class in recognizing the need um, for treating TMD disorders or temporal mandibular joint disorders. He's been doing that for many, many years, as well as recognizing what we call occlusal diseases, meaning that our teeth are not fitting together uh, correctly. And those kind of go together. TMJ disorders, the pain that's associated with that can be de debilitating. I know many of the patients that I've seen throughout the years with TMJ disorders um, really come to their wits end. If you can't resolve that problem, they, that type of pain uh, in the temporal mandibular joint area is debilitating. And Dr. Wils Wilkerson was spend a significant amount of time in, in the study of this when you uh, join us at uh, these IDM meetings and uh, you as a practitioner will appreciate how you can treat it better, but also as a patient, you will recognize how important this is. So uh, we'll, we'll let him actually expound on that. Next slide, please, Kim. And we will wrap it up. I have a couple of things to say. And then Tom and Lori, your closing remarks. One is I just want to remind everybody that February 3rd and 4th are 
uh, inflammation, I'm sorry, our foundation <laughs> seminar. Uh, everyone that came to that, it was live the last time in St. Petersburg, Florida, and we got rave reviews and it was an excellent course. And this time we're doing it virtually February 3rd and 4th. So again, nurse practitioners, listen up, medical doctors, doctors of osteopathic medicine, uh, physician's assistants, dentists, dental hygienists, and we welcome health coaches, anyone in the healthcare space. Uh, we're primarily focusing on the foundational pieces that bring us all together to collaborate for the health of our patients. So it's all day Friday, just take Friday, February the 3rd off and plan on about half of your day. We'll go to mid-afternoon on Saturday, virtually talking about all of these concepts in more detail. And more importantly, uh, for the public, uh, we want the healthcare professionals to be empowered to be able to tell their patients what to ask for, to be educated on these topics, so that as Laura and Tom have uh, taught us tonight, parents can be looking at their children and identifying these issues earlier. And we want all of our colleagues, our healthcare professionals, to leave this course with implementable task, if you will, on Monday morning to be able to put into practice some of these concepts uh, to start moving your practice this direction, or if you're already practicing some of these concepts to take it to the next level. So please click the link, copy the link in the comments and join us on February 3rd and 4th. Tom, Laura, close ahead, us out. Yeah, go ahead, Laura. I'll finish. I just want to say, you know, everyone always asks, where do I start? How do I get started? I want to learn how to do these things, but I see you have these workshops and they're so in-depth. Well, this is where to start. It's at the foundations. As we start at square one, we start at the ground level, at the foundational level, the concepts, bringing that together, understanding those concepts, and then as you could see, moving into each pillar so that you understand how they are connected and how you can clinically apply them. Just like Dr. Pritchard said, you can walk out and on Monday morning, you can start implementing that and applying that information. So I just want to say to all my colleagues, please join us on the third and fourth. This is where we start. We always start at the beginning of the year with our foundations course. So join us. What's so unique is it's going to be virtual. So you and your team can come along long. Everybody can be hearing it. Take the third and fourth off. Join us. Do it as a team. Learn the foundations together, and then you can go from there. Close this out, Tom. Yes. Well, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Gina. Uh, it, it has been our pleasure to introduce the IDM to you tonight. Uh, thank you for listening. We look forward to meeting you in February, and hopefully you'll join us again in August in a live event. So with that, good night to everyone, and thank you for joining us.